Hi, my name is uh, Bob Trazik, and I'm doing a show here starting with uh, John DeVita called Paranormal Activity. Uh, what we're doing is um, radio, um, a radio show on all sorts of paranormal activity, psychic phenomenon, fortune telling, uh, that I'm not quite certain how the direction of the show is going to go. Uh, we'll see how it's going to work out. This is the first one we're doing. Uh, first show is going to be kind of like an introductory. I'll just tell you a little bit about myself, what I do, um, what paranormal is, in case you don't know, and then uh, we kind of go from there. Yeah. Yeah, we'll be touching on, some of the subjects we'll be touching on are um, UFOs, uh, local ghosts and haunting, Chicago ghosts, uh, fortune telling, palm reading, psychic phenomena, and all, all sorts of uh, supernatural interests uh, of everything. Uh, yeah, my name is Bob Trazik. I've had a lifelong interest in the paranormal and in psychic phenomena, and um, I do a radio show on Monday nights. I do with Ward Radio. Uh, at 9 o'clock in the evening on Monday nights, and it's Paranormal Radio Activity. That's the name of my show there. And so I decided to branch out a little bit and, and do this, and um, we're just going to see how it's going to go. Um, paranormal investigating all of a sudden is, is hot stuff. It's a big topic right now. Um, big subjects right now of, of paranormal are Lincoln, for obvious reasons, because of the Lincoln movie that just got uh, uh, shown. And Lincoln himself is an extremely psychic uh, man, one of our most psychic presidents, today being inauguration, um, uh, presidential stuff is going to be on everybody's mind. Um, Mr. Lincoln is, is probably what they call one of our most psychic presidents. Uh, his, his ghost pops up all over the place, all over the state of Illinois. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about Lincoln. We'll be talking about the Haunted White House, uh, ghosts with the Titanic, um, just a variety of different subjects. Uh, all the local haunts here. I'm going to start off tonight, uh, today doing some of the local haunts. We'll talk about that. And then also, too, there is humor in paranormal, too. There is humor in paranormal and humor in psychic phenomenon. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, as a paranormal investigator, what you do is you sort of get a hint, like where something is. Someone has a home or there's a business or a school or a theater or whatever it is, or it could just even be a vacant lot or a cemetery. And um, people say they get a funny feeling there or they felt something there or they saw something there and so just going on a hint or going on a hunch you go and you investigate and what you try to do is you try to debunk it at first uh, you try to look for anything that could make an, an appearance of a ghost everyone wants to see the ghost but there's other ways you experience paranormal you don't always just see the image of the ghost there you will see um, you'll see the ghost that's what everybody wants to do but you'll also smell things uh, a lot of times you smell cigarette smoke you smell a, a certain cologne um, a certain scent an animal scent um, and you hear things you'll hear sounds and hear hear music hear a certain song hear different things uh, so there's other ways you experience paranormal besides the sight uh, so what you do is if someone says geez every time we go there we smell roses at, at the gravesite it's in the dead of winter we, we can't explain that so you, you investigate this, and you try to figure out, all right, was there just a funeral there? Did someone just walk by with a strong cologne? Something that would debunk it. Uh, when you've exhausted every source that you can use to, uh, to try to figure out what would have caused it, then you realize you have something paranormal. Uh, in the old days, they didn't have a lot of the equipment they have now to do um, research with paranormal. Now we've got every kind of camera you can think of and just all sorts of uh, uh, things. Um, in the old days, when you had a ghost in the house, what they did is they put flour. You'd put like a light coating, a dusting of flour around on the tabletops, on the floor, and if there was some movement uh, on that or a footprint or fingerprints, you knew someone was doing it. Uh, there was Things were being moved by someone mortal. It wasn't something supernatural. Uh, if it wasn't moved, the dust, I should say, wasn't moved, there were no footprints, fingerprints in it, and, and books and things were and chairs were still in place, then you knew you had some ghostly activity going on there. Um, but like I say, that's what you try to do. Uh, with a light, you try to you try to figure out: is there something short in the electric system? Is it the sunlight coming through the wall? Is there something something going on that would cause what you're seeing or what you're experiencing there? And then after you've exhausted all these sources and you see nothing there, then you say, okay, we have something paranormal. There's something going on. Um, a surefire thing that you would want to investigate as a paranormal investigator is something that's multiple. If many people have say, claimed to have had the same experience in the same place. Uh, as there are with many of the more recognized stories, like with Resurrection Mary and with Bachelor's Grove Cemetery and some of the more, 
obviously known stories, those you're, you're going to want to investigate and try for yourself and see uh, what there's true. There's also many, many groups now that you can join, uh, a lot of these different paranormal groups that get together and do these investigations, um, and they kind of have a good time doing it. Some are serious about it. Some are kind of just doing it for the fun of it, and uh, most of them do it as a part-time thing. It's very, very rare for someone to make their living as a paranormal investigator. Uh, Okay, so then what I'm going to talk about now is maybe some of the more local ghosts, some of the more familiar things that people are, are familiar with. And we'll start off with our from, most famous uh, Chicago haunt, and that would be Resurrection Mary. Um, everybody, you can't live in the area of Chicago, especially around Archer Road there in the uh, Village of Justice in Bridgeview and Summit and Argo area. That's where I'm from, from Summit. Uh, you can't have lived in that area and not heard the, the story of Resurrection Mary. Um at one point, everybody's heard this from, from childhood on. I heard it. It was probably one of the first ghost, ghost stories I heard, taught, you know, my father told me, which kind of got me interested in paranormal. And uh, there's a few versions of it, but I'm going to give you just the basic version that you may have heard. Uh, Resurrection Mary, we're going back to the late 1920s, early 1930s, and her name was Mary. We don't, we're not really certain of the name. They have like a couple of names picked out for her, but one, they're kind of, kind of narrowing it down. They think her name was Mary Bergovi. And uh, she liked to go dancing at what is still there. It's called Willowbrook Ballroom on Archer Road in Willow Springs, not too far from the Resurrection Cemetery. Uh, but in those days, it was called the O. Henry's Ballroom. That's what it was called. And she liked to dance there. So she went there one evening. It was an August evening. And she went there dancing with a boyfriend, picked her up, took her dancing. And in the course of the evening, she got stood up. And the boyfriend left with someone else or left on his own, whatever. So left Mary there with no way to get home. So she hitchhiked to get back home uh, to where she lived. Well, in the process of the hitchhiking, she was hit by a car, killed, and is interred in Resurrection Cemetery. So her ghost, uh, they, they have a couple of names for her. They've called her Resurrection Mary. That's the more common one. They've called her Bloody Mary, although I don't know why. Uh, they call her the Hitchhiking Ghost. Um, Mary is seen along Archer Road in the vicinity of the uh, Resurrection Cemetery, and she'll be hitchhiking. A lot of times she doesn't actually hold her thumb up and hitchhike, but what it is is a guy will be driving down that road in a car, will see her dressed in, in a white dress, beautiful blonde, very very pretty girl, supposedly she is. I've never seen her myself, but I've talked to folks that have had encounters with her. And um, she will, they will say, can I take you somewhere? Can I? And she will get in the car. They'll stop for her. She gets in the car, and she's very quiet and to herself, and they, they try to hold a conversation with her, and, she, and they ask her, where would you like me to take you? And she says, well, just drive. I'll tell you where to stop. So they'll be going down along Archer Road. They get to where would be the gates to the Resurrection Cemetery, and she says, stop here. They stop. The minute they look over, she's already gone. Some of them have got a glance of her going through the gates of the cemetery, just kind of misting her way through. And then as she gets into the cemetery, she kind of sort of just disappears. Or a lot of times, uh, when they get to the gates, she doesn't say anything, and they look and they notice she's not in the car. She's already gone. Um... There have been a few people. I've talked to about 10 people that have claimed to have had uh, encounters with Resurrection Mary. Out of the 10 I've talked to, I believed eight of them. Uh, and it doesn't mean I disbelieve the other two. I believe they may have had some sort of an encounter or something, but I just don't think they had an encounter with Resurrection Mary. They may have said, had some sort of a paranormal um, experience, but it may not have been Resurrection Mary because there were a few things about the story that didn't click. Um, number one with the thing is... Um, Mary always likes to get off and go into the cemetery. Uh, one of the stories was, no, she didn't go in the cemetery. They dropped her off, and she went across the street into the neighborhood uh, by the houses there, which no were not there at that time. They weren't there in, in the late 30s, 1920s. Uh, that wasn't there. So why she would go in that direction, I don't know. Um, another one was the description was wrong. It just didn't fit the description. Everybody seems to always have the same description of Mary, blonde-haired, wearing a white party dress, uh, dancing shoes, and supposedly this is what she was buried in, uh, that type of thing. Uh, and the descriptions just didn't match. And um, also, too, it seems like it's always single men that tend to pick Mary up, although I have talked with couples. Uh, there have been a couple of couples that said they were going down the road, and yeah, they did see her pretty, you know, blonde, hair and pin curls done, you know, an old-fashioned style, no longer run. Something about it, uncanny. They just didn't like um, the way it looked, but nonetheless, they, they had an encounter with her. So, there again, like I say, you try to debunk this. Now, the police station, which is right on Archer Road there, the Justice Police Station, will do a report. Um, some folks have claimed not to have a, a riding encounter with Mary, but they actually claim to have hit her with a car. And this is where the police come in. Uh, someone will report a woman in a white dress darting across the road uh, in front of their car. They hit her. 
Uh, and they says she just seemed to vanish. They, they don't know what happened. So they go to the police station to report that they had like a hit and run. Well, then, of course, the police will do a report on this. They'll come out and make the report, and there's no, no body to be seen or anything. But they do make reports on this. However, this information is kind of kind of classified. They don't really let you have it. But it does add a little more credibility to this Mary story because if the police are getting involved in writing reports and making stories on it, then there is something to it. Uh, so there's a couple of different versions of that. Um, now, as far as Mary's actual grave site, there again, we're not certain on that. There's a couple of sites picked out for that. Um, and we know for certain it would be in the Resurrection Cemetery, uh, but they're not certain. Um, years ago, the cemetery used to have a thing they called term burials. Uh, and this would have been like during the Depression years. Uh, what you would have done was bought a plot, and you would have been buried in this plot, and you put a down payment on it. Um, at the end of a 25-year time, I believe it was 25 years. It might have been, no, I don't think it was longer. But at the end of a 25-year time span, you had to pay the full payment of the plot. If you didn't, the plot could be resold. The remains could be dug up, moved to somewhere else, and then that plot could be resold. So I think this might be part of what happened to Mary, was she was in one of these term burial plots, uh, and her grave was dug up and she was reburied somewhere else and maybe that's part of what causes some of the unrest with her too she always goes back into the cemetery and she's looking for her final resting spot in addition to the to the thing of being hit by the car and killed uh so there's a couple of different things with mary there's a few stories floating around that's one version of it uh, another one was that she was not dancing at the o henry ballroom she was actually dancing at Liberty Grove, which was another place entirely different, uh, another ballroom altogether different, and actually in the city of Chicago, uh, but she would have been buried in Resurrection Cemetery. Uh, for many, many years, a lot of people around the Chicago area, as well as like the suburban area around there, were buried in Resurrection. It was a very popular uh, cemetery, at one time mostly a Polish cemetery, although now everybody, you know, it's it, it's mixed now, but a lot of Polish uh, neighborhoods and stuff had their burials in the Resurrection Cemetery. Uh, also, too, at the Resurrection Cemetery, it doesn't just stop at Resurrection Mary, the mausoleum at the cemetery there. They built a beautiful mausoleum, and a lot of people aren't aware of it, but that mausoleum has the largest continual stained glass window um, uh, built. It's, it's in the Guinness Book of World Records. It's very beautiful. Uh, from the outside, even with the lights on inside, if you go past it at night, it doesn't look like much from the outside, but on the inside, it's very stunning, uh, the way the colors come through the windows, even on a cloudy day when you're inside there. And... Um, that mausoleum has some haunts to it, too. Um, the folks that work in the office there don't like to stay there past 5 o'clock. Uh, they've had some trouble with the electric in that building. Lights have gone on and gone off. Uh, they've been investigated. No one's been in the building. They've had trouble with the music in there playing. Um, different things, the elevator system not working. They've had the electric done a couple of times. They've had things done to it. They can't find any reasons that would cause this, but these things still keep continuing on. And there again, we believe it's something paranormal going on there. Uh, no ghost sightings have been known to be seen in the mausoleum itself. Uh, and like I say, if you do get a chance to go in there and look, it is, it's very beautiful. It really is something nice to see. But um, there are these things that go on, but usually it's after hours. Uh, Another kind of a common misconception, just to kind of correspond with that story about these things going on after hours, is uh, ghost sightings. Some people feel that uh, any kind of paranormal sightings or ghost sightings that always have to be done in the evening hours. Like, you know, it's got to be at midnight, it's got to be on a thunderstormy night and or a full moon and this type of thing. Not so. Uh, ghosts, paranormal sightings happen any time, day or night, morning, afternoon, evening, any time you'll, you'll see or experience these things. Um, a good many of these are done during daytime. Um, any encounters, uh, I've talked to many folks that have had encounters with ghosts. A lot of them are afternoon or morning encounters. Um, good time for Resurrection Mary sightings. If you happen to be um, a serious investigator about a Mary story, if you want to get started with that, with paranormal investigating, is not during the month of October or during Halloween, like many people think. Because uh, that's when you'll hear all the stories, usually around October, Halloween time. Uh, some story, some newscast or radio show or somebody will do a story on Resurrection Mary. But the uh, best sightings for Mary are in August. Uh, oddly enough, it's like late late August going into the autumn, and it's usually like around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. So that may have been the time when she was coming home from the ballroom and uh, the time of year when she was over there. Uh, we don't know it, but most of the sightings seem to be at that time. There have been other times, too, but most of them seem to be that um, at that time of year. Uh, another theory is that there are two Resurrection Marys, and I'm starting to lean on this one a little bit myself. Um, I have to do a little more investigating on this before I can be certain on it, but there may be two because there have been Mary sightings on 
one side of Archer Road, like where the main gates to the cemetery are, and then also on the other side, which would be Roberts Road. They've been seeing some sightings there. Uh, Resurrection, Mir uh, Resurrection Cemetery, I should say, sort of makes like a triangle uh, between Roberts Road, 79th Street, and Archer Road. It's sort of a triangular piece of property there. Um, so that's what a lot of people have kind of, you know, when you're looking for things to try to explain something off, they say, oh, it's like another version of a, a devil's triangle. It's just a theory, and it's just a story that's floating around. Nothing's ever been substantiated with that story. But it's, it's a theory, and nonetheless, you know, it's something to be checked out if you want to. Uh, they do now, you do have two cemeteries there. You have the Resurrection, and then you have a little piece of land in between, if you're going along Archer Road, and then you have another cemetery, actually a much older cemetery on the end there of Archer, and that is called Bethania Cemetery. Uh, Bethania actually has a lot more of psychic phenomena and hauntings and things going on than Resurrection does, but the Resurrection Mary story is the one that caught on, and that's what people most know there, and that's... Uh, that's the one that people like. That story just caught off, and she's actually a very beloved ghost, and like I say, probably our most famous haunt in the city of Chicago. Uh, some of the stuff that goes on in Bethania, there is a horse-drawn hearse, an old Victorian-era black horse-drawn hearse with the plumes, you know, and the feathers in the horse's head and everything, and that makes the trip from Bethania down Archer Road over to St. James of the Sag Cemetery. Now, why a hearse would be going from one cemetery to another, I've never been able to figure that out, but nonetheless, uh, it has been known to be seen. There is a laughing woman. Uh, people have been known to be visiting Bethania uh, Cemetery. Uh, if you go in there, you can kind of tell instantly, like, the difference between the older cemetery and the new, because Bethania has a lot of above ground monuments and statuary and things where resurrection being newer doesn't have a lot of the same type of things the same cemetery architecture that Bethania cemetery has anyway this laughing woman will come up when you're doing some visitation in the cemetery you're going to visit the graves of your loved ones or whatever and uh, she will come by and she taps you on the shoulder and she laughs she just likes to laugh in, in, in a real loud, uh, disturbing laugh, and she just seems to mysteriously disappear. A lot of times people see behind a tree or behind a tombstone, and then she just vanishes. They go to investigate, and she's no longer there. Uh, two little girls in white, uh, two little girls in white, bows in their hair, dressed in a style, you know, no longer used from, who knows, 80, 50, 100 years ago, that children no longer dress that way. Two little girls in white kind of walk through the cemetery there, and people see them, and then they don't. They're there, and as fast as you see them, your eyes are not focused, they disappear. A lot of times they disappear in front of your face. And then in the evenings, there has been a man that's been seen there um, raking leaves, uh, and this man lights a fire and burns. They say you actually see him burn in the fire. So he may have been an injury. Maybe he at one time was a caretaker of the cemetery, was burning leaves there in the fall, burning a pile of leaves, and somehow or another accidentally he died in that fire. We're not really certain. But these are some of the things that turn up there. Uh, many folks there go with cameras and uh, do photography, and they find orbs. Uh, these orbs are little balls. A lot of times they're white. Nine, nine out of ten times they're white-colored balls or they're blue, and they show up in pictures. When you take photographs, uh, it's the most common thing. A lot of times, too, there's mistaken things, too. You could have a spot on the camera. could be something with the light. Uh, a lot of times if you're investigating on a rainy day, sometimes water hits the lens. It makes a spot, and people think they have orbs. But orbs are the most common thing you find, orbs and mists. Um, now we're going to go a little further down. If we still stick on to Archer Road and we go a little further down Archer Road, we go to the St. James of the Sag Cemetery. Very, very, very old, old established cemetery, I think around 1840, 1841, somewhere in that area. Um, originally an Irish parish was formed by a lot of the families of Irish immigrants that worked to actually build the canal. They actually in those days hand dug the canal. Uh, many of them were killed. Uh, many died from malaria and from disease and stuff, and they are buried in the St. James uh, of the Sag Cemetery. Uh, some of the strange phenomena that have been known to happen in that cemetery is there's a famous story of the couple. Uh, they were an eloping couple. Uh, they were coming with a horse-drawn carriage, uh, and they were going to elope to get married. And they were leaving, and as they were leaving, they had a carriage accident, and both were killed and are buried in St. James of the Sag. Uh, people have been known to see their carriage pull up, them get in, and have been known to witness the crash on that and hear their voices and hear talking. Uh, monks, um, we're not certain of this story, what this has to do with it, but in the evening hours, uh, a lot of times when the conditions are just right, certain time of the year, not certain what time exactly, People have been known to see hooded figures of monks roaming through the cemetery, uh, parading there and, and praying and chanting, and then there again, they just dematerialize as fast as you've seen them. They kind of vanish into nothingness. Also, too, the ground there has been known to raise and lower uh, with people standing there. They've been known to experience 
lowering and, and raising of the ground itself. Uh, the church is a very, very small church. I've only been in that church one time. Um, it's a very beautiful church because it's old, but it's very small. It's a tiny little parish there. Um, sometime, if you have nothing better to do, drive over to St. James of the Sag Cemetery and just take a walk around and look at this, the headstones in there. Like you see, some of them really date, you know, pre-Civil War, very, very old stones there. It's a very old cemetery. So there are a lot of things that happen there. Archer Road in itself seems to be, a lot of people say, why are all these things happening along Archer Road? And there's many stories about this. Um, there's a story of Archer Road being an Indian trail. Uh, at one time, Indian burial grounds uh, may have been uprooted to actually make Archer Road itself. Um, I've also heard the theory that it was covered wagon during during the pioneer days. It was like a wagon train trail, and many people died on the trail on this road through disease or Indian attack or the elements. Uh, so wherever you have any kind of tragedy or any disturbance of graves, you have paranormal activity. You have these kind of things that tend to happen there. So it's just things to investigate, and these I'm giving you more the more common ones. Also, to stick with Archer Road there and keep going a little further down, past St. James of the Sag there, and into the Forest Preserve District, you have Maple, uh, Maple Lake. Uh, Maple Lake has been known to be haunted, too. Um, they've been known to see mysterious boaters out on the lake. No explanation for it. They materialize and they dematerialize um, for no reason. People see them, and then they don't. Uh, orbs have been known to float out over the lake. Um, Different psychic phenomena with lights, different things they can't explain, a mysterious green light in the lake that no one's been able to account for. And the lake itself has been drained. Some years ago it was drained and then refilled. Um, no bodies that I know of were ever found in the lake itself, nothing that would cause it. But for whatever the reason, there again, along that Archer Road area, we just have a lot of psychic phenomena and things going on. Do we need to stop and do a break? Anytime you need to stop me. You, know, you want me to just keep going? Okay, I just keep talking. <laughs> and that's what, that's what we keep doing. Now I'm going to take us a little further down, and we're going to get off Archer Road for a second here for a time, and we're going to go to Bachelor's Grove Cemetery. Probably one of, if not the most haunted spots in the world. Uh, there again, there's pro and con with this one. Um, some paranormal investigators, and believe me, I've talked with a lot of them, say there's nothing that goes on there. For that matter, a lot of paranormal investigators say there's nothing paranormal that goes on in cemeteries. They said, why would a ghost haunt a cemetery? Uh, that's what they will tell me, but then later on they say, yeah, we're doing an investigation at a cemetery. Well, if there's nothing going on there, what are you investigating? But um, many people, many of these investigators believe nothing goes on in cemeteries, but it's kind of unanimous that things do happen in Bachelor's Grove, uh, there again, a very, very old cemetery. It's uh, it's not a Catholic cemetery. It's a non-denominational cemetery. Uh, a very mysterious place. It's over by the Midlothian Turnpike there. It actually was, uh, the road leading up to the cemetery was actually part of the Midlothian Turnpike. Uh, it is now closed off. It's chained. Um, they do, I, well, I can't say they welcome visitors there. Uh, people do go. If you go visit the cemetery during the daylight hours, you're okay. Uh, evening hours after dark, you will have problems there. Uh, police do not want you in there after dark. Um, it's been known to har harbor a lot of strange activity. A lot of satanic worship uh, goes on there, um, some gang activity, a lot of things there, and they don't want that kind of thing going on in the evening hours. Uh, so after dark, you're kind of taking a risk of being thrown out of there or, or arrested and fined. Uh, during the daylight hours, you're okay with it. They won't stop you from it. Uh, what goes on in Bachelors Grove Cemetery? Well, it's a very, very, very old, old cemetery. Even the name itself, we're not really certain. Uh, it's called Bachelors Grove. They think it might have actually started from the name of a family that settled there way, way back in the 1830s, 1820s, and the family's name was Batch Elder. So I think it was actually Batch Elder Cemetery, and then from that it got shortened to Bachelor. Uh, another theory being that the area was settled by German farmers that were single men. They settled the area, and then later on sent for wives or sent for their intended to marry, but it was settled by bachelors, and so their deaths and things, with single men being buried, they called it Bachelor's Grove. Uh, but for whatever reason, I'm not really certain what the name came from, it's there, and it is called Bachelor's Grove Cemetery. Uh, the cemetery itself is fenced in, however, it's uh, not fenced in to keep you out. Uh, it, it almost seems to invite you in. Uh, trees fall down a lot over there. They break the fence. Uh, holes have been cut through the fence. Uh, the gates, to my knowledge, are never really locked. It, it would be senseless to lock the gates to it because you can always get in. Uh, very first time I was out there was 1975, and there was no fence, and actually the, the road to it was open. So you drove your car right up to the cemetery, you parked by the headstones, and you were in. Uh, now you can no longer do that. What most people do is park across the street into the Rubio Woods, the Forest Preserve area, and then walk across and go into the cemetery. Uh, there were originally 200 stones 
in there. There are about 20 left. Uh, they're kind of scattered, and we're not really even certain where the graves actually were because they've been so vandalized, unfortunately, over the years and moved. It's hard to actually tell where the graves were, uh, with the exception of some of the larger monuments. Uh, the Fulton Family Monument is one of the bigger ones that people were unable to move, so it's still intact. Uh, the last known burial, to my knowledge, unless someone has different information about this, was uh, Clarence Fulton himself, who was the last caretaker of the cemetery when it was before the cemetery was closed, and he is buried there in 1989. But it wasn't his body that was buried; it was his cremated remains. Uh, he was the last caretaker that took care of the cemetery before it fell into disrepair, and uh, his ashes are buried there. Now you can close a cemetery down. But the way you do this is you close it 100 years from the last burial. So if your last burial was 1989, 100 years from 1989, you can close that cemetery and then develop that land and put housing or park or whatever you choose to do there. Um, if you do it before the 100 years, you have to have the remains dug up and moved, and they have to re be reburied somewhere else. So there's a little bit of, of politics involved in, in relocating and moving the cemetery. Um, everyone's familiar with the old uh, movie and the story of Poltergeist where they had all these haunts and things going on in, in a housing development that was actually built over a cemetery where the graves were not moved. So they had a lot of problems with that. They thought the graves were moved and then it turned they weren't. And uh, it was kind of a creepy movie. But just to kind of give you a, an idea of what goes on in a cemetery if you don't <laughs> move all the graves before you do something to it. Getting on to what goes on in Bachelors Grove Cemetery, it would be almost easier to say what does not go on in the cemetery. Many things. Uh, headstones have been known to move. Uh, photography. You, you take pictures there, you get orbs. Orbs are the most common thing. Everybody that goes there takes pictures. Orbs always come up in the pictures. Faces have been known to turn up on headstones. Faces have been known to turn up in trees, just in the air itself. There's a small little lagoon that adjoins the cemetery there, and there's trails that kind of lead all over the place in the back there. Uh, there's a mysterious farmhouse that appears, and people see this house, they see the old-fashioned front porch on it, an old frame farmhouse. As they're walking up to it, many people have said they've actually put their hand on the door, the house disappears and goes into nothingness. Uh, there's a story of a farmer who was known to be seen, um, this one I've known of this apparition being witnessed three times. Uh, it might be the case of a ghost, during, uh, a ghost actually going dormant. Um, this farmer has been known to be seen in Bachelors Grove Cemetery with a horse-drawn plow. Uh, and what happened, what his story is, he was plowing the field and something spooked the horse and the horse bolted and ran. And the horse dragged him, the plow, and, and the horse into the lagoon and all three drowned. And they've been known to be seen either coming out of the lagoon or going towards it, going into it. Uh, that's been known to happen. That would be something you would take note of. If you see an old horse-drawn plow in a cemetery, hmm, you know, you got something supernatural here. There's the yellow man, uh, the man that wears a yellow suit. Uh, he's been known to walk around there and uh, walk through trees. People have seen his apparition, and he, he kind of walks through trees and mists himself around. Uh, there's some famous photos. If you look any of this up online or look in any of the books of haunts and things, you see a very, very famous photo of a lady sitting on a tombstone, of a of ghostly image of a woman sitting on a tombstone. That was actually taken, that photo was taken by one of the paranormal research groups that uh, I know of, you know, familiar with Mr. Dale Kaczmarek, a very famous uh, ghost hunter and paranormal researcher in our area here. Uh, his research team actually took that photo. Um, they believe that the Madonna, there is also a Madonna that walks around with a baby, with a child. Uh, they believe now that the Madonna of Bachelors Grove was one of the wives of Senator John Humphreys, who was one of the first residents of the village of Orland Park, because there were two Mrs. Humphreys, and one of them was buried in Bachelors Grove Cemetery, and they believe her spirit is the spirit that walks around carrying the baby. Um, by the Fulton fan Family Monument there, well, like I say, which is one of the bigger monuments, uh, usually if you walk over there, you see a small stone for a infant daughter. And they think that may be the infant that um, that is, is being seen in, in the cemetery. Um, although that wouldn't make much sense for it to be buried by Fulton, and their name was Humphreys, but nonetheless people do. Uh, if you do walk over there, you'll see a lot of times people leave little dolls and beads, candles. They leave little money for whatever reason by the stone of the infant daughter. A lot of people just out of sympathy for her. Uh, you have this house, like I said, that disappears, this ghost of the man. Uh, there's also a dog. Um, there is a dog that appears at the entrance to the cemetery, a black dog that snarls and barks at people. I've never known of him actually biting anyone or anyone having any kind of a bad experience with him, but he does tend to appear there. Uh, once upon a time when you used to visit Bachelors Grove Cemetery, it wouldn't be too uncommon to see an animal slit open um, 
some sort of a, a remnant of a ritual, uh, animals, pheasants. I've, in, I've never actually seen anything bigger than like a goat, a dog, or a pheasant carcass uh, nailed to a tree or laying over a tombstone. Because like I say, it was an area that they do a lot of, um, for that matter, they still may do a lot of satanic worship out there for whatever reason. They like that spot. Uh, like I say, trees have been known to sway there. It's it's sort of a very quiet area and very peaceful, um, kind of still. And you do notice an absence of animal activity. For it being a heavily wooded area, you don't see a lot of squirrels, a lot of rabbit, deer, things you would see there, you, you would think you would see in a normal um, wooded area like that. It's almost as if they kind of avoided themselves. Uh, trees there have been known to sway real violently for no apparent reason when there's no wind. Uh, just like that. And like I say, trees do break very frequently. They're all over the place. Uh, and they almost seem to invite you in because they seem to fall over the fence and knock the fence down and stuff and, and make it, you know, paths open for people to get in. Uh, if you do walk past the cemetery, the area of the cemetery where the headstones are, and you walk down a little further, you will notice... Um, Foundations. You'll see a lot of little foundations from homes, which may have been buildings there. I don't think they were residences, but they may have been um, buildings used to care for the summit. It maybe held equipment and things. And there are a lot of wells. Uh, there is a small little running stream there, and there is this lagoon. It's sort of a greenish lagoon-type looking thing. I don't know if you'd want to use that water for anything, but maybe in days of yore, the water was very clean and very pure, and you could use it. But a lot of wells I always found kind of mysterious that there'd be wells dug in an area where you have so much water already there, so much natural water. Uh, none of these wells are still active. They are buried in, but nonetheless, they are there. That's another little mystery of, of the Bachelors Grove Cemetery. Um, also, too, there is a stone. There was for many years, and I think it's been moved now, and it was just right outside the fence of the cemetery, and it was almost like just a plain rock, a boulder, and it was actually a black um, woman that was buried there, and she had been a slave or a former slave. I'm not certain of the story of her who had m managed to relocate up to Illinois and then died and was buried in the cemetery. But back in the day, you know, Jim Crow being very prevalent and her being a, a black person, she, her burial was not allowed in the cemetery. It had to be buried just outside it. So that's why her stone was there, just a plain marker, and she was buried there, not actually in the cemetery. So you do have a lot of these strange phenomena and things in Bachelors Grove. Um, in, in the heyday of the gangster years of the 1920s, um, it was a uh, common belief that it was a gangster drop-off spot. Um, if you had a body of somebody that you bumped off and you wanted to get rid of, they would take them out to Bachelor's Grove, put them in the lagoon, and they'd never be heard or seen from again. Uh, urban legends tend to uh, pop up also with this. Um, a lot of these things, um, the haunts, uh, Resurrection Mary, Bachelor's Grove, um, St. James of the Sag Cemetery, the ones I've just been talking about, a lot of this has been going on for many, many, many years, but it seemed to all resurface again in the 1970s, 1980s, and then it kind of fizzled, and now these stories and things are becoming popular again. So they kind of have their, like, 10-year, 15-year run, and then they, they pop back into everybody's uh, memory, maybe because there's a new generation that's exploring ghosts again. Uh, there's a phantom car. Uh, the old Midlothian turnpike, which is the road you will have to walk. It's a closed road. You'll have to walk up that road to get to the cemetery. It's a little bit of a walk. You have to go through a wooded area to get into the cemetery itself. Uh, people have been known to dart and jump out of the way from a car that comes down that road, and then it just either goes through you, hits you, and just disappears, or uh, they step out of the way, and then the car just goes off into nothingness and disappears. And then there's the old urban legend of, oh, back in the days when it used to be a very isolated and very quiet spot. It still is pretty much of um, couples used to go there and park and do their do their necking and do their sitting and doing what they do in cars. And um, one such couple parked their car there, were doing their thing, and um, they felt some noise going on the roof of the car. They could not get the car started, so the boyfriend said, well, you stay in the car, I'm going to go out and investigate. And they couldn't start their car, so he said, well, I'm going to go and see if I can get some help. We'll get the car going and that. So he leaves the girl in the car, and supposedly he left the doors unlocked. And uh, she remains in the car the whole night long, and the boyfriend is gone, and she dozes off, wakes up in the morning to find policemen all around her and everything, and they ask her to get out of the car and to walk over towards the squad car, but don't turn around and don't look back. Well, she does, you know, who wouldn't, right? This is the stuff horror stories are made of. And what does she see? None other than her boyfriend's carcass hanging without its arms above the car with his feet dragging onto the roof of the car hung. Uh, one of those urban legends that started some of the ball rolling. We're not sure if there's any truth to that story or not, but nonetheless, it does kind of add a little bit to the um, to the thing of Bachelors Grove Cemetery. 
Uh, now, the connection I mentioned with the Humphreys family. Um, Senator John Humphreys had a home in Orland Park. Um, the home now is still there, and it's on the historic registry. It's a very nice home to go. If you ever get a chance to, uh, there's very, it's very limited hours that you do get to visit it. Uh, a lot of paranormal activity happens in that home. Uh, it's an old home, dates, I believe, 1881, and it is the second home built in Orland Park, but is the oldest home still there. The first home that was built is no longer there. The first building is no longer there. Um, this home was owned by Senator John Humphreys. Um, a lot of paranormal investigators love to investigate this house. Uh, very, very old. Uh, a lot of activity seems to go on there. Uh, a lot of shadow figures are seen. Uh, things tend to move um, cold spots, temperature changes, temperature fluctuations, um, a good way to experience anything paranormal going on is when you have um, fluctuations in temperature in, in, in the um, just in the temperature in the atmosphere changes in the atmosphere they have all sorts of uh, things now that can read that and tell you um, uh, some folks uh, I noticed one thing about the house when I go through it is it seems as you go up the stairs and into the second floor of the home it gets cool uh, and it would you think it would be the other way around because usually like when the heat in the home rises up we all know that heat goes up but when you go on the second floor second floor seems to be cooler than downstairs than, than the ground floor of the house um, there's an attic up there there's a lot of things that they do use to furnish it and like I say the home is on the historic registry so even if you don't believe in paranormal and it's not your thing it's just a nice home to visit um, the folks there are very friendly every second Sunday of the month just for two hours from two to four they do open it up to tours and it is free if you do want to give a donation or whatever you can you know give them a little donation and they appreciate that but um, that home has a lot of paranormal activity in it and people do like to investigate that place a lot of the paranormal groups love to investigate that um, I myself like to do um, open areas I'm not so much with the homes I like to do that's why in the winter time I don't do too much investigating uh, I like cemeteries. I like open things. I like things out in the open. I like to do that. That's my thing more than inside uh, places. Although a lot of stuff happens inside as much as it does outside. Uh, cemeteries. Another favorite spot of mine is the old Woodlawn Cemetery, which is in North Riverside. Uh, Woodlawn Cemetery uh, in itself is not a haunted cemetery per se. It is not a Catholic cemetery. Um, but what goes on in that cemetery is there's the... Um, burials of the victims of the circus train wreck uh, in 1918 I believe it was June 22nd 1918 there was a circus called Hagen Bach and Wallace uh, and this circus was a traveling you know circus that went around during the, the spring and summer months and traveled and set up tent and towns and did their performance their shows and they were doing a show in Indiana just outside of a Hammond I believe it was and for whatever reason they were stopped on the tracks and they were, I believe, switching over to another track to take them into Hammond. Well, a troop train, this would have been 1918, so it would have been a World War I troop train, unbeknownst to them, um, slammed right into them, full, full throttle, coming right behind them, and it slammed right into the circus train, and it caused a lot of deaths. Uh, many folks died. I believe there were over 160 deaths from this, uh, injuries. Um, many of the folks were not identified. Uh, to make matters worse, it was a big fire, too. They had a lot of kerosene lighting on this train and stuff. Uh, fortunately, no animals were present on the train. Animals traveled on another train, so this was just personnel, people, performers. Um, one whole performing family of a trapeze um, act was wiped out in this. And in Woodlawn Cemetery, they have a little area there called Showman's Rest. And that's where a lot of the people that were victims of this were buried. Um, you will go, uh, it's very easy to find, just go right into the main gates, the main entrance, I should say, of Woodlawn, and go to your left. And you will see, just go down the road a little bit, and you will see five statues of elephants with their trunks down. And that is Showman's Rest. Um, that was actually built there, uh, formed by Buffalo Bill Cody, the famous Wild West man. Uh, there's another Showman's Rest out in Dakota, I believe it is, and there's this one. There are two of them. And it was designed for folks that could um, show people that didn't have a burial, couldn't pay for burial, so they would have a place for a decent burial net. And many of these folks are there. They don't know their names from this uh, circus wreck uh, some they do have, there's one stone there, it's Baldy, so that was apparently his nickname, and that's what's on his stone. Uh, another one, they have the four-horse driver, that's what he was known as. He was a man that drove a team of four horses, and that's what's on his stone, four-horse driver. Uh, many of the other stones are just simply unknown male, unknown female, unknown, unknown. A couple of them, they do have names, they know who they were, and all these folks are buried in this cemetery, along with a lot of other old uh, stones there, too, from different performers and things. Uh, what's been known to happen there is people have been known to go there and experience smells. They experience the smell of burning. 
uh, probably from the fire from this uh, horrible train wreck that killed all these people. Uh, they've been known to stand there on a calm day and hear a crash, just hear some horrible wreck and horrible crash and look to see nothing going on on the street, nothing going on around, and they just hear this, and they hear this awful mangling of, of metal and wood crunching and all this and no explanation for it. And then, too, people have been known to hear animal sounds. They've been known to hear lions roaring and, and elephants, what do elephants do? Do elephants bleat or roar? Whatever elephants do. We, yeah, <laughs> they've been known to hear that uh, happening at that cemetery. Although, like I say now, there were no animals killed in this disaster. And then this is one of the things people tried to debunk. They say, well, if you're hearing animal sounds when you're there, Brookfield Zoo is not too far down the road. So on a good day when the sound travels and there's not a whole lot of traffic around there, you may be hearing animal sounds coming from the zoo that are just drifting over by themselves. That may be what you're hearing. So there's a way to debunk everything. Uh, nonetheless, there is some activity that has been known to go there, and um, if you get a chance, it's nice to just go and visit Showman's Rest. It's a nice little peaceful spot there. It's a small little plot of land. It's not very big, and you will notice it right away. Um, elephants with their trunks down. They are, there are five statues of elephants around it, and they have their trunks. Their, not their trunks. Their tusks are cut. So they were performing elephants. So they were obviously statues of elephants that would have been circus performers. So their tusks were not pointed for you know for injury to other to trainers or to other animals, other elephants. And their trunks are down. An elephant with its trunk down is a sign of mourning. And I believe it's their right foot that is picked up and rests on a ball. And it's a sign of mourning or of sorrow. So that's what that is. So an elephant has its trunk up. It's good luck. It's joy. It's happiness. When an elephant is excited, when he's in the water playing, when he's pushing, uh, spraying dust up over his back and on the uh, African plains and the Asian um, areas where elephants are from, they're happy and they're contented. So whenever their trunk is up, uh, that's why if you ever buy a statue of an elephant or one is given to you, always make sure the trunk is up in the air. His trunk is never pointing down. It's uh, presumed to be bad luck to buy a statue of an elephant with the trunk down, always with the trunk up. That's a little thing a lot of people don't know. Okay, I'm going to do some humor. We have some graveyard humor. Like I say, I like cemeteries and that kind of thing like that. I have a book that was given to me. <laughs> and this book, these are actual tombstones, and these were actually some of the sayings that were on the tombstones. Um, now, some of these stones were found. They actually do have pictures of them in the book. Of course, we can't tell you this on the radio, but I can tell you what they say on the stones. Uh, a couple of these I marked off because I thought they were so good. Uh, one of them simply says on the stone, it has the man's name and the date, and it says, I told you I didn't feel good. <laughs> Very simple. That kind of says it all. Okay, we have another one here. Pardon me for not rising. This is actually on, these are actual things that are on the stones. The man's name is Roger M. Rothstein, and it says, Pardon me for not rising, in his date, 1935 to 1988, when he was buried. And then the uh, caption they put in the book is, they says, Oh, forever the gentleman. Pardon me for not rising. Okay, and now we have another one. It's the Farrer family here. There's a couple buried here, so it's obviously a husband and wife, Jerry L. and Jeanette M. Farrer, F-A-R-R-E-R. -R -E -R. And then they have their dates on the stones, and it says, I was supposed to live to be 102 and be shot by a jealous husband. <laughs> so it didn't happen. I'm not quite sure what that means. So uh, apparently she had another boyfriend. Uh, Bill Kugel. Now these, these are actual things that they put on the stones. It says, he never voted for Republicans and had little to do with them. It's on his stone. Very staunch Democrat there. Okay. Here we have a stone by Miss June M. Wingo. Dated Mar uh, February 4th, 1948 to March 9th, 2005. And it says, the shell is here, but the nut is gone. Go figure this out. So apparently Miss Wingo must have been some sort of a jokester in her uh, life. Okay. Uh, let's see. Now here they have a picture. This one is just kind of a weird one. It's a stone. Barbara Sue Mayner, M-A-N-I-E-R. And there's dates of her, her, her birth and death, uh, April 29, 1941, April 29, 2005. And it just says, Our Mom, we miss you. Her stone is there, and there's also a statue of a parking meter. What that's about, I don't know. Uh, and then the caption that they have in the book with it is, it says, If only we remembered to feed the meter. So I don't know if she was a, a meter maid in, in her life before she passed away. Well, then they have a picture of a stone here. Uh, Mr. J.J. J. Jacobs died June 11, 1899, aged 42 years. And his stone is in the shape of a suitcase. And the caption they have that goes along with this is the death of a salesman. It's like a little traveling salesman's attaché case that he would carry around with samples in it. Uh, what else do we have here? 
let me see. Let me find some other ones. I few uh, blocked a couple of these out in the book that I thought were interesting ones. Um, cemeteries are interesting places to visit. Cemetery architecture in particular, particularly older cemeteries that are beautiful with these statuary and things. I'm going to talk a little bit when I get through with this about New Orleans cemeteries and some different burial customs in different areas here. Okay, and then this one is Harriet, Miss Harriet B. Early, dated 1879 to 1976, and it says, now she's late. And then right after that one, they have a stone that says Tardy. That's the family name, Tardy, and it says, better late than never. Ida Oman. Uh, this one I didn't understand. It says Ida, I-D-A is her name, Oman, O-H-M-A-N-N, -N, and it's 1870 to 1896 is her date, and it just says D-O. I have no idea what that's about. Some joke that I missed. And then there's another one here. It says Ida B. Small, 1875 to 1955, and it says Ida Drew the Short Straw. Okay, this is another one. It says Infant Reusing. R-E, infant, the word infant spelled out on the stone, very plain, just a small little square granite stone. And it says Infant Reusing. R-E-U-S-I-N-G, and it just gives the date, 1905-1905. So the baby died, you know, possibly at birth or within the year's time anyway. And uh, it just says, Recycling Gone Too Far. So I don't know if reusing was the name of the family name or what, but that's just what it says. Uh, Edna K. Plump. And then it says, She's not fat, she's just big-boned, which she probably is now. And then we have a stone here which says Santa on it. <laughs> so it, that's all it says. Just a granite stone. just says the name Santa. And it says, Mrs. Kloss told him not to use off-the-brand reins. Budget. Another family stone here. Plain stone with a little lily and granite on it. Never, ever, ever miss your numbers. Budget. Ransom. This is on a headstone. And then the caption that they put in the book to go along with the ransom headstone says, they misunderstood the kidnapper's instructions. <laughs> All right, coffin. We actually have a name on a stone coffin. And then the caption that they have with this, it says, yes, but what's in it? <laughs> there's a stone named Going, family name of Going. And then right after that, of course, there's a family name Coming. <laughs> okay, there actually is a headstone here with the family name of Dead Man. D-E-A-D-M-A-N, very appropriate to be on a tombstone. So there is some humor to be found in stones. We're going to take a break here. You want me to stop in two minutes, or you want me to just keep going? All right, I'll keep going. What I'm going to talk about now is um, burial customs. Um, I talked a lot in this uh, introductory uh, episode here about cemeteries and cemetery things, and then to give you a little bit of cemetery humor. Uh, cemeteries are serious, but they're also interesting, and they're also educational. Um, cemetery architecture is something to behold. Um, the first, very first cemetery for the city of Chicago, a lot of people may or may not know, was Lincoln Park, where Lincoln Park is. And uh, they decided right around the years just before the Civil War to move the cemetery out of the city because they felt for health reasons. People died from cholera or whatever disease, and they felt being buried that close to a populated city, which Chicago was becoming very populated, may not be in the best of health interest. So they had the cemetery moved uh, to another location. I'm not certain where it was actually moved after it was Lincoln Park. But there is one mausoleum that is still there. A lot of people don't even know it's there. If you look in Lincoln Park, there's a small little building. It almost looks like a garden building, but it actually is a building that is a mausoleum. That is the Crouch family. Uh, all these many years later, the Crouch family were, had a lot of political clout. They actually knew Abraham Lincoln. They knew the mayor of Chicago, the governor of the state of Illinois. They knew everybody, and they did not want their family mausoleum moved. So they are the only ones that are still in Lincoln Park. There's a little mausoleum there. I believe there are four caskets inside there. And the Crouch family, or the ancestors of the Crouch family, have the keys to it. And it is still there. They were the only ones that were not moved. Um, how many of the other ones were moved, we don't know. There may be still some burials that were left in there. We don't know. Every now and again, you hear about them doing some work or some digging, and they do find um, a couple of bones here or there, possibly somebody that was not um, moved. I'm going to talk a little bit. I'm going to shift gears here and talk about some other burial customs uh, in different places. Now, I mentioned here in Chicago Catholic cemeteries and non-Catholic cemeteries. Uh, the Catholic Archdiocese of Chicago, and I'm not coming down on them, I don't want to sound that way, but they just don't welcome a lot of the talk about the supernatural 
and with the cemeteries and that kind of thing. Like Resurrection Cemetery, if you were to go into their office and ask them about Resurrection Mary, they would laugh you out of her. They don't acknowledge that at all. For whatever their reasons are, they don't like any um, acknowledgement of supernatural things happening in the Catholic cemeteries. Non-denominational and non-Catholic cemeteries, it's another story, and then also to in other parts of the country. Now, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite spots, which is New Orleans. Uh, cemeteries in New Orleans are very different from what we have here uh, up in our area of the country here in the Midwest. Uh, they actually call them Cities of the Dead, and if you visit them, they're big tourist attractions. They have actually cemetery tours. You pay money to go on these tours. Uh, and if you do visit them, they do look like small cities because they have all above-ground burials for reasons of uh, the climate there. Uh, New Orleans being a very subtropical climate with a lot of heavy rainfall and being below sea level, um, in the early days of the founding of the city, you know, over 300 years ago, they found they could not do below-ground burials because they had disastrous results after a heavy rain. Uh, caskets and bodies tended to buoy up and, and wash through the ground and come up. So they came up with the system of above-ground above tombs. Um, you will visit cemeteries, and you will see a small mausoleum-like structure, and you'll see 20, sometimes 30 names on there that date way back to the 1700s. I say, how is it possible? How could all these remains be in this one little house type thing like this, this little cemetery? Well, they have a very ingenious system for burial down there. Um, what they do is you bury a person in there. You open the, the door up, person dies, and the casket goes in. Okay, after one year and one day of being sealed in this tomb and the hot, humid climate down there, everything deteriorates. So casket fragments, bone, everything deteriorates, and after one year and one day, you can open this up, and they have like a rake type thing, looks like a shovel, and they just there's this little slit in the back of the tomb, and they just push whatever fragments are left, and they push them all the way down to the end of this, and it goes in the slot and down into the ground, and into a receptacle, and it's down there. Now, after one year and one day, say grandma passed away, and then then grandpa passes away, one year and one day after grandma's death of being buried in there, you can put grandpa in there, and then the same thing. Grandpa's casket goes in, and after one year and one day, his remains will be pushed down into the slit, and he'll be down there jumbled around with Grandma and what everybody else that's down there, and then it makes room for another family member. So it's a very economical way of burial because you only buy it like this one plot, and that's it. So you only have multiple plots. Um, they do this. Now, what, what happens, say we have a death in the family, and six months later we have another death. It hasn't been one year in one day. What do we do now? Ah, we have a problem. Well, they have a small, what they used to call cemetery ovens, because that's what they look like. They almost look like old-fashioned brick baking ovens, and you temporarily buy or rent one of these. You put the body in, and at the end of the one year and one day, you take whatever remains are left out of that, you put them into the family tomb, and then it stays there for the rest of its time, and then it, too, goes down into the slit, into the receptacle, and it's pushed in there, and that's that. Um, the New Orleans cemeteries, the Catholic Archdiocese in New Orleans is, in New Orleans is very, very open to the supernatural, and they even advertise that uh, with many of the churches down there. There's a small chapel down on Rampart Street. It's called Our Lady of Guadalupe. It's a shrine to St. Jude, and they call it the Mortuary Chapel because back in the days of illness and disease with yellow fever epidemics in the city of New Orleans, a lot of them were buried and actually hospitalized in um, the Mortuary Chapel. They wouldn't take them to the more prestigious St. Louis uh, Cathedral, for, for burial and for nursing. They took them to the smaller church on Rampart Street. They did that there. Uh, another unique thing they have in that church is a statue of St. Expedite. Um, voodoo is a, is a big thing in New Orleans. It's very practiced down there, and it's the voodoo capital of the United States. And St. Expedite, um, <laughs> some people don't call him a saint. He's big in voodoo, but in the Roman Catholic Church, they really don't call him a saint. They have a statue of him in the church there in Our Lady of Guadalupe. And the story that goes with that is years ago, the statue was shipped to the church, and it had no name, no address, nothing on it. All it said was expedite on the crate. So them not knowing where to send it or what to do with it, they just opened it up, kept the statue, put it in the church, and just named him St. Expedite, or they call him St. Expedite. And he is the one that you say prayers to if you want things done in a hurry. He expedites it and gets it done for you in a hurry. Uh, okay, I'm going to get back to cemeteries here. Uh, a city like New Orleans, where you have so much death, you did in the past, uh, so much, you know, with the hot, humid climate and mosquitoes and you had yellow fever and malaria and a lot of things you couldn't control for many years. And um, every 10 years or so, or even sooner than that, maybe eight or five years, you'd have an epidemic that would come through and you'd lose a quarter of your population. So you have a lot of death there, which is probably another reason outside of natural disasters such as hurricanes, which we all know what happens to New Orleans after hurricanes. So New Orleans never really built up a huge, huge population of people and became a real big, big city, such as like Chicago or New York. 
Uh, so they do are associated with that. So death and dying down there is, is a big thing, and cemetery tours are very popular. Um, they do have signs on the cemeteries, particularly some of uh, the ones that are a little not safe to visit, St. Louis Cemetery Number 1 and St. Louis Cemetery Number 2, older cemeteries. Uh, they do have signs on there, Catholic, uh, the Catholic Archdiocese and the City of New Orleans welcome visitors to the cemetery, but please be advised that we cannot guarantee your safety in the cemeteries. And if you've ever toured any of them, you know why. Um, they have low walls around them, so vagrants do like to jump over and sleep in the cemeteries. Um, there is a lot of voodoo practiced and things in the cemeteries there, and you're asked not to touch anything. If people leave uh, small you know, beads or money or candle offerings or an animal offering, in some cases a chicken or something, on a grave, you're asked not to touch that. Uh, so you don't. You respect that. You respect someone else's religion, someone else's wishes. Uh, and many of these tombs are open and in disrepair because they are so old, and vagrants uh, do like to go in there and sleep. So, yeah, it's also a good spot for muggings, too, because the cemeteries are, you have all these little houses, and it's easy to hide, and they're kind of haphazardly done, uh, the way they're laid out. So it's it's a good place for a mugging or a robbery, that kind of thing. So you do have to be careful. Uh, if you do plan to visit New Orleans and you do plan on visiting the cemeteries, my advice is not to go on your own to take one of the tours. They run many, many tours down there with the supernatural. Like I say, it's a very big thing down there. Uh, and the Catholic Archdiocese down there feels very, very differently about it than the Chicago Archdiocese does. Um, they do welcome you there, but it's better to take one of the organized tours. And then also, too, if it's your first time down in the city and you know anything about it, they will explain a lot of things to you that you, must, you yourself may not know. Uh, interesting thing to see. Uh, cemeteries in New Orleans I cannot recommend it, uh, enough of. We will stop now. We're going to stop. Or do you want me to keep going, John? Just seven minutes. Oh, I have seven more minutes to go. Okay. Oh, yes, I keep forgetting to look at the clock here. Yeah, I, once I get going, I just keep talking, and you don't shut me up. I just go. <laughs> so that's kind of my introductory um, um, uh, show here. We're going to start doing that. Also, too, if you do have an interest in paranormal, you like these types of shows and stuff, um, guests in that, I'm not really certain how the format of this show is going to go, and it... Um, I'm doing this show, I don't know what time it's going to be aired, but I'm doing the show here at 10 o'clock in the morning here. Um, what time they're going to air this show, I don't know. Um, I'd like to maybe try and bring some guests on, some other people that are in the paranormal field, um, but I don't know about being able to get anybody at this hour in the morning when we tape the show. So I'm going to see about that. We'll see how that's going to go. Um, you can always listen to me. Um, I'll do a plug for my other show I do on WARG Radio. I'm on 88.9 FM. Uh, Monday evenings. I'm on there from 9 o'clock to 10 o'clock in the evening, and I do a uh, show there, Paranormal Radio Activity. Just before the show, we do a little bit for about uh, half an hour or 40 minutes. We do a radio quiz show there called You Bet Your Life. If you're an older uh, radio listener and TV listener, you may remember You Bet Your Life when it was on the air for many, many years, hosted by Groucho Marx. The show ran on radio, and then it went to TV, and for a few years it was simultaneous on Radio and TV, it was on both, and the show ran for about 14 years. So we don't in any way want to be compared to Groucho Marx, because you can't. But we do run the quiz show, and we have a lot of fun doing that. And it kind of breaks the case, because some of the guests that I have on for Paranormal Radio also are, are guests on You Bet Your Life. And they, um, when they do the quiz show, they're a little more comfortable with speaking on the radio by the time they get to Paranormal. And um, I have something being passed to me here by somebody that I'm supposed to say. Oh, streaming audio on the Internet. Yes, you can also get us on the Internet. We are on... Um, how do they get this network here if they want to, on Internet? It's right there, Windy oh. City Hometown. Okay, what is it here? We're Windy, Windy City, City Hometown City. Network, so www.windycityhometown.com. Also, too, I just found this out. I've done a couple of shows with them before when they do their Chicago Historians uh, show here on Mondays. Um, I just found this out myself over the weekend that you go up on YouTube and punch up Woody City Hometown Entertainment Network on YouTube, and you can listen to the radio shows. So it was kind of nice. I got to listen to a couple of the shows that I did here in the past. Um, right after this show, coming on at what time? In an hour? 12 o'clock. Coming on at noon. So they'll be coming on in a few minutes, in about a half an hour. They will be doing a show called Meet the Chicago Historians. And their topic tonight is, or this afternoon I should say is, what's your topic, Jack? Uh, life in Chicago, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Life in Chicago yesterday, today, and tomorrow. It's a pretty open topic. So they'll be talking just about any kind of Chicago history or anything you want to mention. They have a nice panel of very knowledgeable folks that come on and just kind of keep an open chat for them. Okay, let's see here. we got time left. i got five more minutes to kill here. All right. So listen to us on WARG Radio for Paranormal. Uh, here with this show, I'm not certain, like I say, when this is going to be aired, but we will announce it. I will let you know as soon as I find out when they're going to be airing this. And... Um, Thank you for listening. We're just going to continue with this, and we'll see how this goes. And um, 
Also, too, what else can I say? Geez, tours. If you're interested in doing supernatural tours, uh, that type of thing like that. I, with the town I live in, in Summit, uh, the Summit Park area, we do have one. Nothing for the winter months too much coming up, but I do have a Chinatown tour coming up in May. That will be the Memorial Day weekend. I believe it's May 24th, it is, or 25th. It's the Saturday before Memorial Day, and we will be doing a Supernatural Chinatown tour. We're going to be going, taking you to have lunch at a Chinese restaurant, talking about Chinese fortune-telling. We'll be telling everybody's fortune with the Chinese uh, sticks, fortune-telling sticks, uh, talking about Chinese superstitions, and uh, there it is. He's pointing it out to me. It's May 25th. That's a Saturday, so the tour will be May 25th. Um, and then from there, we go on to Chinatown. Um, my good friend Richard Crow, I don't know if you all remember Richard Crow, he just passed away last year in June. Uh, gosh, you can't talk about supernatural in Chicago without mentioning Richard Crow's name. Uh, Richard Crow always told me, he says, you don't find any more superstitious people than Chinese and Italians. And I'm half Italian, so I can vouch for that part of it. And uh, Chinatown has a lot of things and a lot of, a lot of stuff there. So we'll be doing a tour, walking tour through Chinatown, and then we'll stop for some refreshments. And um, like I said, we'll be having dinner. And talking about all that and taking you to all kind of different places and also taking you to one of the more haunted locations in the city of Chicago. It's a form, it's a bar now. It's a former Coletta's funeral home called Ethel's Party. Yeah, it was, uh, before that it was, um, Tito's on the Edge because the building's located right on the edge of Chinatown, uh, in Taylor Street, which used to start the Italian neighborhood, which now Chinatown is kind of expanding and it's, it's going into that. Uh, that tour, I'm just kind of doing a little commercial here. That tour costs $30, and that includes the lunch and your transportation. We bus you around, we take you there, and we give you a hand, you know, a guided tour with that. And if you're interested in doing that, give the uh, Park District and Summit a call. They're at 708-496-1012. And then I'll be doing some lectures and things at different libraries coming up in April and May. I do um, a nice presentation. I like uh, Titanic. One of these shows we'll be doing here on Titanic, too, and on the haunted history of the White House. Um, my Titanic presentation, I don't tell you so much about the sinking in that. I like to concentrate on survivors and suicides and what happened to them and some of the supernatural and psychic connection that went on with the Titanic. So I'll be announcing some of those things, too, as they pop up uh, in time. And um, other than that, thank you so much for listening. And I'm going to um, sign off now and then stay tuned with uh, Windy City Radio at noon for Meet Chicago Historians. And thank you so much for listening. Bye-bye.